town of the good, the bad, and the weird. You either live by the gun, or you die by the sword. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And we are a podcast to talk about film and culture. We are going to watch movies when we can, talk about them when we can, and some of it will make sense. Maybe make our friends watch it. We're going to try to. <laughs> so, today we are talking about The Wizard of Oz and Sucker Punch. We watched Wizard of Oz and thought, what's another movie that happens all in the main character's head? Sucker Punch. They're the same movie, almost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very, very, very loosely. I've, I, I've, got, I've got stuff to argue with that. Same. Um. <laughs> same. But anyway, we watched Wizard of Oz first, and it had been a while since I'd seen it, but I grew up watching it almost every year on the dot, thanks to ABC. Yes. Well, I I didn't really grow up with it too much. I mean, I'd seen it from time to time. My uh, community theater in high school, we did a rendition of it, and that was I think that was actually the last time I did anything with The Wizard of Oz, and that was back in uh, 2008 or 2009, something like that, so it's yeah. been a while. And then I went to college for six very long years in Kansas, <laughs> about 20-minute drive from a town whose entire call to fame was Wizard of Oz. Was Wizard of Oz film there? I don't think so. No, no, it <laughs> definitely was not. Why? I never could quite figure out why that was their thing, but it was. They had great food, they had a very good festival, but it really embedded into me the fact that this is the only thing people outside of Kansas know Kansas for. And there's a very mixed relationship by Kansas people on this. Yeah, well, that that was one of the interesting things. Like when I found, like I found in my research, uh, because I I ended up watching quite a bit of the side notes and side topics, uh, documentaries and stuff in regards to it. But Wizard of Oz honestly was a cultural phenomenon. It's considered like the quintessential, uh, quintessential, or whatever, however you say that. Um, it was the uh, it, it's an American story. It is, and I have somewhere in my notes that it is the most watched movie ever. Yeah. I think Cong the Library of Congress or something like that said that. So is that the truth? I don't know, you know. Um, actually, yes. Uh, um, back in... Oh, it, it's been a while. I had it written down somewhere, but did I write it down for this? You bet I did not. No, I didn't. Mine is in regards <laughs> to somewhere over the rainbow. Um, but there, there's actually a quote from the composer and lyricist from Wicked, Stephen Schwartz, that I think is actually perfectly sums this up, is The Wizard of Oz is one of the, the most central films to American mythology. Not one single day goes by in America where there isn't some quotation from a movie, a magazine, or in a newscast, or in some television show. Yes. And... Something that I ran into when I was doing my research, was, n which was nothing like your research, I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> was um, the red shoes. So, I don't know if you ran into this. I had a pair of sequenced red slippers that were meant to look like Dorothy's. I don't know why I had them as a child. I was never allowed to wear them. I think I wore them to my cousin's wedding once, and my mother, like, cherished them and had them in a glass box. And apparently there's only six of them. No, five of them. There are five of them, one of which was stolen. But fear not, it has been recovered. Hmm. Yes, I can say that. No, I was not allowed to wear red sequin shoes when I was a child. You're missing out. I think. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't get to wear them very much. A little disappointed in that. But anyway, so jumping back into the movie, especially as watching it from an adult standpoint and not like with my mom, who watches everything from that Hallmark film lens. Um, I had a lot of questions with the movie. Number one, we could have avoided this entire movie with the simple use of a leash. Yeah. If the dog was just on a leash, I feel like we could have avoided 99% of the movie's problems. Uh, but it was never on a leash. Ever. And that bothered me. A lot more than I think it was supposed to in the movie. Yeah. Well, I think also, like, 
from our schooling, we were taught to like really try and analyze and really deeply look into stuff more than we should. It probably should. It makes probably. me. It makes me feel like uh, back when I was in high school, I got annoyed with English teachers where they were like, "Read into the book. What does the gray sky mean?" Mm. And yes. Well, I, f- I feel we kind of do that, but in film it's a little bit different because you have the visual, you have the audio, and you have a lot of other workings in between. Yes, and one of the things that I thought was interesting looking back on it was the amount of little nitpick stuff that you, as a rewatcher, you can look at. Like, I found a toucan this time watching it. <laughs> I'd never noticed the toucan before. There's also a swan. I don't understand the bird population in Oz at all. <laughs> But the thing is, is Oz is the most watched movie. Sucker Punch is not. No, it's really not. But the amount of stuff to look at is almost the same. So stuff isn't the thing that makes a movie rewatchable. But is it? Because I've now rewatched a ton of Sucker Punch on YouTube solely for the fact that I can't remember what's in the background. (laughs) Well, I mean, that that kind of goes back to, like, how deep do you go into the movie. True, because Sucker Punch wants you to go all the way. Yeah, but it, it is fun to go back and rewatch it, and I, I probably will at some point this year go back and rewatch it just with all I've learned from the casting and production and yes. all that, because there there really is a lot to this movie. The other thing that I think proves Oz's success is, and I don't know how much you ran into this in your research, but from a cultural standpoint, the amount of reproductions of Oz is ungodly. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, that, that was the thing, like, initially looking into this, I was surprised that there were seven iterations, not of the story we know of The Wizard of Oz, but iterations of the books yes. to film that came before this movie. Well, and then in in my childhood, the pinnacle of you, you've you made it culturally is, has the Muppets made a movie about you? And the answer for Oz is yes, and you should watch it, because the the amount of just weirdness going on in the movie is perfect. For example, <laughs> Toto is not played by a dog. He is played by a Mexican shrimp. It doesn't make sense, but it's better. <laughs> and I have not seen this, so this is all new to me. <laughs> and while I was attempting to look it up, I thought surely the main Wikipedia article for the movie would talk about the spinoffs, and it does. Does it mention the Muppets one? At the moment, no, but it does m- mention two separate Tom and Jerry movies about the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> which I've yet to see, and I'm a little disappointed I didn't watch those instead of the Muppets one to an extent. But I'm not upset about seeing the billboard of Miss Piggy. I'm imagining seeing that big dog from Tom and Jerry as yes, Toto. <laughs> I kind of hope it is. I didn't see any of it. I'm saving it for a rainy day, but... The, there's just so many times it's been redone. Example being, we've got Disney got their mitts on it by doing the the new Return to Oz or Oz the Great and Powerful. That's Which what it's called. I haven't seen yet either. Uh, eh, eh. Okay. It's Disney. <laughs> it's Disney's attack uh, on it. Oh yeah, with you, recent Disney's very hit and miss though. Yeah, and you can you can feel the the wicked energy coming from that movie because wicked. It, another version of it, a stage version, which, by the way, is, in my opinion, one of the greatest Broadway things to hit in our time. But it's weird, because it's the same energy, but not, and yet the amount of Sucker Punch recreation materials, even like an EA game, is non-existent. No, there actually is a uh, game published by Atlas. There's a uh, I RPG, find it. Wizard of Oz. No, it's not very common. Well, that's the thing with Atlas, though, is there... Oh. there yeah. If it's an early Atlas game, good luck finding it at a good price. Yeah. But. And when I when I Google Oz, I get everything from ornaments to t-shirts, parades, more movies, quotes, you name it, stuff up behind the scenes. And when I Google Sucker Punch, especially from, from my point of view as a non-deep diving researcher, just, you know, first page of Google's good enough. <laughs> uh, the only thing I could find was the intense battle between I hate this movie vividly and you just didn't understand the movie. <laughs> Which, I mean, I don't know, maybe they didn't, but I feel like they did and chose not to like it. (laughs) Yeah, which I've I've got some stuff to bring up uh, when we get into that later. Um, But for me, I think how you know that you've really made it as a cultural icon is when you have historians. This is true. There's an entire, like, 
separate series on YouTube that I found where the guy is, like, breaking down Wizard of Oz, and it's not just one episode. It was an, what I felt an unnecessary amount of episodes, but mm. clear to someone it's not. Like, we're talking, like, scene by scene breaking down of this movie. What was he breaking it down? Like, everything that happened in it, or, like, everything I... behind it? I got bored. You got bored and quit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm i here for the really tiny ponies in the beginning of the movie when she squishes, squishes the witch. Uh, I'm here for the, uh, hold on, 124 members of the Leo singing midget group, uh, Munchkin group. I don't really know how to correctly address that group because every article I found felt politically incorrect and a little awkward to read get very interesting yeah and i mean that that's the thing that's really dated about the movie um is like it's it and th that that's the thing that's kind of the for me was the tying theme between these two was that they're really about kind of accepting where you're at in life not saying that home like there's no place like home is a bad thing but it kind of made it feel like hey you had this great adventure now except being in boring, gray Kansas. Yeah, that was the part that, without nostalgia goggles on, was a little awkward to rewatch, especially knowing we were pairing it with Sucker Punch, which, yeah, she accepts her fate, but not because she wanted to. She no. fought the whole way. Dorothy just kind of is. Dorothy never really changes throughout the movie, other than maybe learning to pick up her tiny dog. Yeah, well, and that that's the thing with both these movies is that, um, getting into it is they're both kind of told from a, I don't want to say unreliable viewpoint, uh, the, the Wizard of Oz is, it's someone's dream, it's a magical land, but Sucker Punch is definitely from an unreliable narrative. True, and it's the dream part that kind of, uh, really interested me because, both of them saw their dream worlds as a brighter, more colorful versions of their current worlds, but also one took it as my world is so much better in the dream world, and the other one went, it's, everything's kind of shitty. Yeah, I need to go back home. Even though she talks about, like, see, moments before singing about somewhere over the rainbow. Yeah, that was the other part that really uh, confused me. We sing Over the Rainbow at the beginning, which is an amazing song and has its own cultural thing that I'm sure could go on forever. Just, that's a whole different can of worms. But then we sing it again at the end, and it's, uh, is the end of the rainbow home? Because you were already there. Mm -hmm. So is it a full circle rainbow? Is it a double rainbow? <laughs> Well, the thing with uh, the, that that scene in particular, uh, from my research, they originally wanted to cut that. Mm. Like it, they felt it slowed the plot. It does. But they fought to. It was fought to be kept in, and the the thing it did is it created the uh, kind of a theme song or icon song for the main characters. Which, I mean, I'll give it that. You can't hear that song nowadays and not immediately think of it. Whereas Sucker Punch's music infuriated me to no end, but I love it. Not because the music itself is bad. The music's good. It yeah. just has nothing to do with the movie. No. And that that was the frustrating thing for me watching it is like, it went, f uh, and for me the most jarring scene was uh, when they were trying to get the lighter yeah. from the mirror. It transitioned from queen to rap. Like, and th there's ways to do it. I've heard good mashups before, but it just, like, was a harsh transition. And it wasn't even like they transitioned from the dreamscape to the even deeper dreamscape. Yeah, it was... Like, the music by itself really, you know, fine. Not that bad. Some of it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was also interesting just because Wizard of Oz was coming from a musical at that point. Yes, which that was something we learned too, was that the first musical was what, in 1902? Or yeah. the first stage play was in 1902, because everything before this was a silent film. And we're talking seven iterations. Yeah, and um, my husband and his wonderful family are all music nerds, specifically musical nerds. And when 
when we were talking about it, a lot of people in our group were like, yeah, my high school or, you know, my young group did this. And immediately all of them were like, ha- no, this musical is not for children. <laughs> <laughs> it's too hard. Well, my, when, we, when we did it for my high school, um, my mom actually played the uh, Wicked Witch of the West. And she scared children in the audience. I think I tried pulling up some footage to show you, um, but no, yes. she, she she has a great cackle. <laughs> yes, I love it. Well, and I remember uh, just same kind of theme. We went to go see another high school rendition, which, I mean, they did a good job, but some of that's hard to play and a lot of it's hard to sing and act. Mm-hmm. And they had some pretty cool effects where they caught the scarecrow on fire at one point on stage. And mm-hmm. my little cousin was very, very upset that, A, a woman is squished under the house because they had the cutout so a real person's legs were kicking under the house. Oh, wow. And she was upset that we were not saving this person. (laughs) (laughs) And then she was very upset that the people on stage were on fire. (laughs) Well, yeah, I I can't remember if how we did the scarecrow, but I remember my mom, she actually still has one of the brooms. They had a couple brooms that shot pyrotechnics from it. That's so cool. And when we're talking, we we had a small community theater. Like we, it was com- it was combined with the community, and it was also combined with the high school because we were on a military base, and our high school wasn't big enough to host something by itself. Yes, and then speaking of Scarecrow, the side characters for Wizard of Oz are pretty much more of more or less a main character from just storytelling and then remembrance. Nobody's favorite character is Dorothy. Everyone's Scarecrow, Tin Man, or the Lion. And the, those three are so impactful that, like, the way all three of them walk and move is just, that's that's a whole thing by itself. Well, even then, the casting was kind of interesting in itself because the guy who played the uh, Scarecrow actually was originally cast as the Tin Man, but he always wanted to play the Scarecrow. And so they he, he requested, and they had no issue with it, so they recast him. Well, even with then, like a lot, most of the characters were second choices. Like Dorothy, for example, uh, uh, Lowe's Inc., the parent company of MGM, originally wanted Shirley Temple to be the actress. Can you imagine? And I don't know if you had these when you were a kid, but when I was a kid, the amount of Shirley Temple remake uh, DVD commercials <laughs> on Saturday mornings was real obnoxious can you imagine if she'd been in wizard of oz <laughs> uh, I, I mean and i've seen the i've seen the commercials i have never seen a shirley temple movie oh you're missing out animal uh, crackers in my soup every day <laughs> and, I, and i hated that as a kid i hated i hated that song so much but like and that, that's the thing is they actually sent uh, uh people out to go or they sent someone out to view shirley temple live and they just said her she didn't hold up to snuff like, she, she didn't have the vocal range. and Well, and yeah, that was one of the interesting things, is if when you're watching the movie, Dorothy starts out very childlike, and then the second she gets to Over the Rainbow, there's like a switch that goes off, and she suddenly has like a very mature singing voice mm-hmm. that that's hard to pull off. Yeah, and the thing with uh, casting Judy Garland... Um... And the thing that I th- I thought was interesting, too, going back and watching it as an adult, because I didn't think much of it as a kid, she's not particularly glamorous. She's she's yeah, pretty, but she's, she's pretty. like Midwestern kind of pretty, I guess. Not, yeah. saying, not saying that there aren't any gorgeous chicks no, in the but Midwest. Like, the standard Midwest is not your California avocado on toast girl most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Like, it does crack me up, though, because while we were watching it, especially... Several of us growing up either in Kansas or on farm property, Dorothy's handling of herself on the farm from the movie is real poor. Like, the girl falls into a pig pen at one point. Like, honey, what are you doing? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, well, and I mean, talking about that is like, uh, in the casting, uh, the Wicked Witch of the West was actually cast originally as someone else. And she they thought she was too pretty for the role, from my understanding. And huh. there were also complications. And so the lady who was uh, cast as uh, the Wicked Witch, uh, what's her name? Um, she, uh, Margaret Hamilton, she was cast, uh, and she, she has a pretty funny story with it, is uh, uh, they, called her, they called up her agent to cast her in The Wizard of Oz, and she's like, oh, 
cool. Well, who am I going to play? And uh, the uh, her agent's like, the Wicked Witch. She's like, the Wicked Witch? She's like, of course, who else? <laughs> and and Which, she, she's iconic now for that. Yeah. Well, and the the look of each character in Wizard of Oz is incredibly detailed. Like, example being, in the books and early renditions, the Munchkins are all wearing blue. They don't wear all of the bright color and flowers, and then to take advantage, supposedly, of the new technology for the color, they changed a ton of stuff. Example being those red slippers. In the books, they're silver. Yes. They're changed to red. What, but what was weird was watching that with that knowledge. There's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of cool colors. And then you get to Sucker Punch. And Sucker Punch uh, really embodies my high school spirit of yesterday's eyeliner can be today's smoky <laughs> eye if you try hard enough. <laughs> I have never had to go through that, but... You know, you just don't take it off and you hope for the best <laughs> the next day. But it, well, it was weird because... Even even in the muted, more grungy tones, you're still seeing a very similar thing where in the dream world, in the dancing world, at least we get some color. Yeah. We finally get a little bit of sparkle, a little bit of sequence, maybe a red lip here or there. And it's it was kind of fun to see the two very, like, parallel but separate yeah. ways that that was handled. Well, with, with the Technicolor, I know a lot of people assume that Wizard of Oz, and it was promoted as, like, the first film in Technicolor. I would say it's the first major film in Technicolor. There, there was some before it. Um, I think the first one was about uh, Leif Erikson or something. I don't, I don't but know. But even before then, they had done uh, stuff with tinting and uh, color colorizing films before. But really, The Wizard of Oz, and we, we can kind of see it um, with like if you play with Photoshop or anything like that. How Technicolor worked, it was three black and white cameras uh, shot through a filter and dyed with their, with their respective dyes and then recompiled. And that's how you get that depth of color. And the set for Wizard of Oz was extremely hot. And required a lot of energy. Um, from what I, from when I was watching some of the documentaries, they were talking about how there was brownouts in the nearby towns. And they even had to build a, uh, a power station or a, a side station on site to deal with it. Yeah, and it's kind of it's kind of interesting how it's changed because that was all filmed on set. Everything, with the exception of a couple of pieces here and there, that that's in front of a camera somewhere being acted out. Whereas yes. Sucker Punch, it, it has that new kung fu movie sort of thing going on where maybe none of this was actually filmed on a set. It feels a lot green screen, yeah. if not all green screen. Um, actually, the only uh, out-of-set shots were the clouds in the very beginning of The oh. Wizard of Oz. Those are real clouds. Everything uh. else was done on set. You know, that makes the Kansas farm a lot more understandable, because yeah. it's, it's, it's there. It's a thing. Yeah. Also, um, one of the things that was, I don't know, striking about it was he, there was an impressive depth of color, and yet at the same time, it felt very Crayola boxy. It, that that's exactly what happened. Uh, the backgrounds, the, the it, it, they were uh, crayon matte draw, painting, or I call them paintings, but they're more like drawings. And that that is why they feel very storybook Crayola esque, is because they were done in crayon. And as weird as it is, it kind of makes the movie more timeless. Because example being Sucker Punch's CGI, yeah, it still looks good. But it's it's not as clean. There's definitely some choppy bits here yeah. and there. There's definitely some parts where you're like, you are being pulled on a wire right now. Mm -hmm. Don't even try. Whereas the storybook part of Dorothy and Wizard of Oz just kind of keeps you in that world. Yeah. And so from one of the interviews with one of the surviving munchkins, they were talking about how when Dorothy's leaving uh, through the yellow brick road, they... Uh, they, re they remember seeing her just walking into a black background is because the backgrounds were imposed on top of it. It was a type of matte framing, kind of like there's a, there's a photographer called Jerry Oldsman. Can we talk about the Yellow Brick Road for a moment? Because I have a lot of complaints as just 
a general public person who uses roads occasionally. That is the stupidest road on this planet. The Munch, well, from what I saw, and I did very little research into it, either the Munchkins are ignorant of what's beyond the Yellow Brick Road (laughs) because they say just follow it and then it has a fork into like four different paths. And then it just disappears through a deadly field of flowers, which I understand in different iterations of the story via book or that old animated one that I watched, which by the way, kind of thought the animated one's story was better. Yeah. A little bit more continuous. Didn't have the whole Gandalf witch wizard thing going on where, oh, you could have done it by yourself the whole time, but I'm going to be gone. Bye. <laughs> the, uh, Gandalf. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in that's not, none of those are the versions that people generally remember and or even watch. Oh, yeah. No, so, like, I, I was watching uh, the, the ones that I was kind of curious about and I thought were, they were hella weird. Uh, the, there's three films from 1914. And they were all produced by uh, uh, the author of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, what's his name? Um, that guy. Yes. Um, Al Frank Baum. He, uh, he actually produced those. And one of them became the framework for one of his books, the, His Majesty, the Scarecrow of Oz. Yeah. And th- the plots are really weird. Like, towards the end of... Uh, and they're, all, they're all stopped. Like, people in costumes and whatnot. But in the Magical Cloak of Oz, uh, there's these uh, there's these people who live up on this hill. And they have some weird obsession with soup. And they invade and almost conquer an entire nation for the new types of soup See, that they could have. I don't remember that part at all. It, it's, towards, <laughs> it's towards the end of the Magical Cloak of Oz. It was... It, it was one of the one-off ones. Like, Dor- Dorothy's not really in too many of the old ones either. Yeah, because, not gonna lie, Dorothy's nobody's favorite. Kind of like Harry Potter is nobody's favorite character in Harry Potter. Dorothy's not really the favorite character here either. She's, I mean, she could be, but she's not bringing a whole lot to the table here. Yeah, and th- that was another uh, uh, interesting fact that uh, so one of, a critic, uh, Michael uh, Strago made in regards to the Wizard of Oz that at the time this was a huge cultural phenomenon and he likened it to Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Yes. But like these were books children people grew up on this stuff and then to see it brought to theaters. Speaking of people growing up on this stuff somewhere in my notes oh yeah here it is okay so people grow up on this stuff not just the movie but also the book is considered a pretty solid point in children's literature and a lot of schools will put it in as part of their curriculum Mm -hmm. in 1986 i found a lawsuit oh yeah (laughs) i don't know why this is the thing but (laughs) (laughs) there was and in the lawsuit that i found uh and again minimal research done here but the fundamentalist christian families in tennessee uh opposed the inclusion of the book because witches uh Females being equal to males and the talking personification of animals very much upset them, hmm. which really, it gave me the giggles because now, nowadays it's, and like, obviously 1986 was not that long ago at all, but even back when it came out, I wouldn't say it was like rocking any boats by any means. No. Well, the thing is though, too. Honestly, The Wizard of Oz almost could have been a forgotten film uh, because most people don't realize that during this time frame when films were released, it was a uh, vertical system. The distributors owned the theaters, and so it was only in for a short time because they had a schedule of other films to get because most of their works were just like, let's pump out as many films as we can. And on top of that, Wizard of Oz didn't wasn't a financial success when it was released. No, um, to be honest with you, it's not until way later that it actually makes people money. And by that point, from what I understand, it had reached public domain at one point before it hmm. was really raking in some money. And whoever owns it now, I think it's Disney. I don't, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. I know Disney owns at least portion of it because they've got certain versions of the movie out my favorite being of course the muppets version with queen latifah (laughs) why queen latifah why not i ask 
Um, so, it, but it's also one of those things where it's like, can any one person really or should own all of Oz? I don't think so. I like yeah. having this huge variety. I like having the random musicals pop up where you're like, like Wicked, like Oz, even the weird spinoff movies, and I keep finding new animated versions of this movie, Yeah, which none of them are actually that bad. Well, part of its loss was... Uh... It, it was mainly marketed to children, and children's tickets don't sell well as adults' tickets. And on top of that, two weeks after this film was released, Hitler invaded Poland. Yeah, and, that seems kind of important. Yeah, I mean, that killed their international market. Although, I did learn that it was uh, popular in England and Australia, particularly in uh, Australia, some of their African forces used to use Off to See the Wizard as their battle song. Yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. But, and that's the thing is, it, it wasn't int- it wasn't even introduced into television until 1956. E- that's true. But since then, it has religiously played right alongside yes. Charlie Brown's movies and um, The Sound of Music for every occasion. Yeah. What holiday is it? I don't know, but it's Wizard of Oz holiday now. <laughs> Yeah, and and that was back in 1959 is when it became the broadcasting tradition. Now, I learned something interesting that would have potentially given The Wizard of Oz a completely different viewpoint. Um, The Wizard originally had almost no roles, or like very very little of a role in it. Um, But at one point it was discussed uh, in the wash and clean scene. When the, everyone's getting ready to see the wizard. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, question on why we have a robot polishing machine and a scarecrow stuffing machine just ready and at the disposal. Reasons. Are there lots of these things? I mean, are, you, are scarecrows like a huge part of the population? I feel you, like we should have run into some. Yeah, you would. Well, I mean, we only got to see like a very small part of Oz to begin with in the film. I guess so. But uh, so Fr- Frank Morgan, the man who portrayed the wizard, has six roles in the film. He plays the gatekeeper, he plays the stagecoach, he's the wizard, uh, and I can't remember what else he does. But the thing that they, there was a brief discussion, and it was briefly mentioned in uh, uh, the commentary of the, of the tw- I think I have the 75th anniversary of the film. Um, but it w- there was a discussion that the wizard should appear in blackface in the polish scene. Ah, that yeah. would have probably not ended as well. No, no, not not in the least. But uh, huh. it, it's still kind of an interesting fact that you don't you don't think about that that stuff was still going on back in the day because the whole cast of Wizard of Oz is white. <laughs> this is true. Well, unless you count whatever color scarecrows and tin mans, but they're they're not played by anyone of No, e- exactly. Well, and that's kind of the weird part too is Sucker Punch, I mean, yeah, the main characters for the most part are white, but you do get a nice coloring of cast in there uh, sprinkled throughout, especially with the girls who, I don't know if you got the same vibe, but I got barely Charlie's Angels vibes out of the girls, Mm -hmm. like to the point where I... I could have sworn a couple of them were the same people, but they definitely aren't. No. They're definitely not, but very Charlie's Angels vibes. But at the same time, I don't remember any of their names. And I feel kind of bad <sighs> about that. Yeah. Because, like, I didn't hate the movie like a lot of people online did. No. I, I'm here for a good time. It was a good time. Yeah. What, is it a sensible time? No. It no. was There was a lot of questions and plot hole problems, but it was visually entertaining. Yeah, and I think that that was really the point of it. In both films, they're both visually entertaining. Yes, very which, much so. Which I learned Sucker Punch was or- originally supposed to... It, got, it started getting hype before Watchmen. But yeah. the director uh, ended up doing Watchmen before Sucker Punch. Well, and not gonna lie... Watchmen's a hard act to follow. There was a lot of people when that came out who I remember being very obsessed with it. Oh, yeah. Um, And it feels like the fan cult following of Sucker Punch didn't happen until, like, kind of way later in the in the game. But... Well, something interesting, uh, back to, like, the makeup and the coloring. Yes. Like, everyone knows that the Tin Man had issues with it. Well... 
Poor dude. I found out more about that. It wasn't just like an allergic reaction. They were using aluminum powder, and he was inhaling aluminum particles. Is he dead by any chance? I don't know off the top of my head. Because I feel like that would be a causing factor. Well, he he was in the hospital for uh, weeks. Six. They said he was in the hospital for six weeks, and he was only on set for ten days. And even then, the uh, Jack Haley, who ended up playing the Tin Man, didn't escape either. He, they switched to a uh, cream, I think it was a more cream based, but he got some in his eye and he was out for a couple weeks. Man, that's brutal. I yeah. feel like surely, like I, I get that you want him to be shiny and all that, but surely there's, we're going to figure something else out. Well, I mean, th- this is back in 1939. This I don't, I don't think there was a whole lot of options back then. Like This is true. I feel like back then your options were kind of what we have at the Dollar Tree now. Those are your options. Yeah. Well, like, my mom and I were talking, just like when we were growing up, you had one type of bullion cube, mm. and that's all you had. True. True. But, like, e- even makeup-wise, the one who got it the worst was uh, uh, Margaret Hamilton, the Wicked Witch. She uh, oh, she almost died when she, uh, tran- when she fell through the yellow brick, or disappeared from the yellow brick road. They launched the pyrotechnics too early, and her hat caught fire. Well, her makeup was copper based. Oh, good. Yeah, she uh, she got uh, major burns on her hands and Man, head. I feel like acting is a very dangerous job. Yeah, it can be. Well, like Harry Potter, one of the stunt doubles for Harry uh, broke his back. Yeah, and it seems like every big action picture, somebody's breaking something a couple of times. It yeah. just. I don't know. I like my desk job. Yeah. Risk of breaking things <laughs> minimal. Carpal tunnel, though. Oh, real bad. Yeah. But I feel like I could get, like, a little pillow for that. Yeah. I mean... Nice and cushy. I, we can we can get those grandma gloves that they put on for knitting. We'll get those. But... Well, and even even then, like, the, the extras weren't spared either. The, uh, no. Two of the flying monkeys fell yes. and hurt themselves. Which... Especially rewatching it, it it's a testament to how good and attention to detail they put in. Because the flying monkeys, you know that they are people. There's no way they're not. But at the same time, that's a pretty believable flying monkey. Yeah, well, I'm. I mean, it's no R O U L. And and that's the thing. Uh, for for me, watching films, and you know, I watch so many films every year. Like I always appreciate practical effects yes. i think those w- practical effects done well hold the test of time they really do and even even the ones that aren't done super well some of my favorite movies are coming to mind yeah you can catch the spot where you're like oh that's definitely a man stuck into a rat costume attacking another grown man <laughs> <laughs> but i wonder what movie but even though it looks pretty goofy it's becomes part of the charm whereas with the cgi ones you kind of you kind of just get stuck in the loop of oh that 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 part yeah uh, especially like really old cgi for me specifically is when you see lightning in old films yes but it's also my favorite <laughs> because because it's of the time it's nostalgic which is like yes. wizard of oz you watch it for the nostalgia yes speaking speaking of parts that didn't age well when we were watching Sucker Punch, it was the same week that Paris had the tragedy with Notre Dame. Mm. And as a gr- room full of architects watching the movie, halfway through, the entire room went, Is that Notre Dame? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so, I mean, if you're going to blow up a major building, maybe maybe be a little bit more specific or careful in your picking. But at the same time, I mean, you, you it's burned before. Well, you can't plan around that. Like, I was yeah. watching... Uh... Especially with, like, today's conspiracy culture and stuff. I was watching Snake Eyes by Nick Cage, and that ah, movie yes. came out pre-9-11. And, like, yeah. I was watching it, and it's like, th- this probably would have done really well if it was released nowadays. Yeah, and it was kind of awkward to watch for a little while after that, because every, every big explosion location that came on, we all were sitting there trying to figure out where it was, mm-hmm. which... I think Notre Dame's the only actual place that we we couldn't find the other castles well, or locations. So yeah. if they are real, they weren't portrayed enough that we could find them. And this is a room full of five people who all have gone through history of architecture a couple of times. 
Well, we had two classes on it. I had three. Jeez. And then I took a second one for funsies. Uh, I'm glad I took theory classes instead. <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting from from my from my sitting point of view, as someone who I like movies, I enjoy watching them, but I don't watch nearly as many as you do, and no. I'm not here for like the amazing portions. Like example being Avatar. Avatar was cool. I didn't really care all that much about you know the groundbreaking portions of it. I'm just here to watch the movie and have a good time. Yeah. Um. But one of the things that was kind of interesting about Sucker Punch versus Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz created this whole world around itself that is still rotating mm -hmm. and still people are still making things based off it, still actively participating in it. Where Sucker Punch, while I was watching the movie, I was writing down all of the different cultural or subcultural points that they were trying to hit on and my list was getting really long i've got steampunk kung fu grunge britney spears from the 90s slash 2000s esh well in gangster spy like in, in, in regards to that too like i know there was a lot of issues with that movie uh, especially like the sexism in it mm. and there was a quote uh from Zack snyder uh the director that really made sense like i mean it it is a fetishized film is what it is yeah he, he says on the other hand though it's fetishized and personal i like to think that my fetishes aren't that obscene who doesn't want to see girls running down the trenches of world war one wrecking r wrecking havoc and you I, know what he's not wrong because while we were watching it at one point i asked at what what time period was this movie supposed to be in and you told me, and I was like, I have yet to see anything portraying this time period. But you know what? I will give it to these girls. The yeah. mini skirts are on point. <laughs> there is only one like mess up I can find where the mini skirt and the panties don't quite cover each other up. No. But you know what? One out of that whole movie for how much flying around and kicking that was going yes. on. Yes. That's some that's some magic and, skirt properties yeah. right and, there. And at one time he even uh mentioned he described the movie and I, I think this ties back to like Wizard of Oz and the fantasy world. Alice in Wonderland with machine guns. Yes. Well and then one of the things is my favorite genre of movie, hands down, is probably Kung Fu. And not good Kung Fu. I'm not talking oh, yeah. No, I'm not talking the general Jackie Chan level kung fu. I'm talking like CGI'd out the fuck, just giant gorillas fighting a normal sized man. <laughs> I I started watching one that we'll have to watch at some point. Uh, the man with the iron fist. Yes. Do you like it? <laughs> so far, I've still got 30 minutes left to it. I was tired, and I'm like, <laughs> I need to go. To this. I, this was at like 10:30 at night. And I'm like, I have work in the morning. I need to go to bed. But it reminded me a lot of that because. Of, of that genre, that specific genre of kung fu movie where I'm not here because the kung fu's good. I'm not here for the stunt good. I can tell that you are being flown around on a mm -hmm. wire. There's That is way too many steps for you to be making in the air, good sir. But you know what? I'm having a great time. And for me as a kid, cr uh, Crouching Dragon, Hidden Tiger. Yeah. Or, yeah, cr Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Yes. Yes. That... <laughs> I, I know my movie names. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you get it wrong in Kung Fu, it's probably a different movie. Right. Uh, and there, there's a there's a whole <laughs> way down that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I it, it's interesting going back and watching these movies the way they go together. Like, th they're a very similar plot. It's both people, one, one unintentionally escaping from her drab world, or from her drab world, and one purposely escaping from her drab world. You could make the argument, though, that she unintentionally was forced to escape from her drab, sad world. Because... Which one? Not Dorothy. Not tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've lived in Kansas and Missouri long enough to know that while the tornado that hit Dorothy is a weird freak tornado, and I feel like you should be more prepared, sweetie, than that. Uh, also, that was one of the points that I kind of wish you had seen the Muppet version of. Yeah. Because in the Muppet version, Dorothy and her aunt and uncle live in a trailer park. And there is a storm shelter there, as per our standard normal codes, which hopefully everyone follows. 
sometimes. But <laughs> in that one, she goes back into the house because her pet shrimp Toto obviously cannot save himself. <laughs> And he's the only pet she has. And that's where it all goes wrong. And the house goes sideways and stuff is flying around. And in movie Dorothy, I am very confused as to how nicely she just lightly gets tapped by a window. <laughs> and the house is then like, I, and I've been to disaster port like towns before to help out. And I've seen the houses that are picked up and then put back down, but nobody's picked up and put back down like that. Oh no, no! I've I've seen videos of houses getting torn apart by tornadoes. It's crazy, and honestly, the tornado is definitely one of the most iconic scenes in that film. And it really is. Like when I was a kid, I was always told it was a, uh, a stockings. It it is stockings. It's a little bit more complicated <laughs> than that. It's not just pantyhose being twirled around in the background. No, well, I mean, it almost is. It's actually uh, pantyhose wrapped around chicken wire. Ah, chicken wire. And uh, attached at either end to a gantry and a cart to make that moving dynamic. Uh, yeah, because that, that four twister, that's a pretty good, you know, dual motion where the base of the funnel and the top of the funnel, they don't necessarily have to be doing the same thing. Nope. And that that it's also a cool effect too. I'll have to uh, show show you the diagram of how it was shot, but it was used. Uh, um, they they use rear projection for that, in which there was, it was a model, and then it was projected onto a screen behind Dorothy. Ah, oh, that, that makes that makes sense. I mean, yeah. we don't want to have that many pantyhose going on. Yeah, and there was actually a cut scene from the tornado too, uh, of the tornado actually enveloping the house. Speaking of cutscenes, did you ever get around to watching the cutscene from Sucker Punch? No, I did not. I'm a little bummed that it wasn't part of the actual movie. And, like, I get it, cutscenes, we gotta save on time. We're already kind of long for what the movie is. But the cutscene really much more accurately depicts what the lives of the girls is. Mm -hmm. Like, throughout the movie, one of the things that really bothered uh, one of the friends we had watching with it was that the girls only peeled potatoes yeah look why are we eating so many potatoes you guys okay are you irish uh, maybe. <laughs> it's not addressed well it makes more sense with the cutscene because it shows how the actual business is being run and how it's a theater and they're probably cutting potatoes for like french fries or something like that mm -hmm. and it shows you know the stage and the customers which is weird because i hadn't thought about it but it does bother me a little bit that throughout the whole movie, it, there's all this talk of the big rollers and the highballers or whatever they're calling them. I don't know. But it, there's talk about them. But with the exception of that cut scene, we don't really see the business side. There's just a lot of dance class going yeah. on. And that that's the thing, too, with uh, that movie. Like, of course, you're only, meant, you're only meant to see a certain portion of the world. True. And, and my thoughts on that... Um, how the movie opens up really got me thinking about this. The story is not told from Baby Doll. This is true. It's which is, told from Sweet Pea. It is, which is very interesting because the, the story and who you're looking at it through is a huge portion of the plot. And it was kind of funny because one of the people we were watching with, he completely forgot about the first like 20 minutes of the movie almost immediately and was like drowned into this theater portion and mm -hmm. was really confused when we got to the end. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, it starts off in a theater and it ends with this kind of dreamscape. Like, yeah, it, it's almost like once they come out of the, once they go back to the real world, because almost none of the movie takes place in the real world. She's getting the um, procedure done. Lobotomy? Yeah. Lobotomy. Yes. She's getting the lobotomy Not done. Vasectomy. No, that's a different that procedure. That is. That's a different part of the body altogether. Um, but yeah, so she uh that that's when we come back to reality. True. But even then like whose reality is it at that point? Which is a good part, which, uh, a good point because having that knowledge really kind of changes uh, a good portion of how you think about the movie. Mm -hmm. Whereas one of the things that we thought was kind of interesting about Wizard of Oz was when we do come back to the real world, or what we assume to be the real world, we we get to see much more clearly how each of the characters of Oz is someone from her life. Mm -hmm. Except for her dad. 
What is he supposed to be the wizard? Well, that actually uh, was modeled after the ni- uh, 1925 silent film. The, okay, so should have watched that one then to understand yes. that part. But it was just kind of uh, an odd throw to have everyone be somebody. Well, and- except for a few... But and, and there was there was other st- there were other little things added like uh, the farm hand who's uh, fixing the windmill. They leave out a portion where he's talking about he's inventing a machine with a real heart to ward a, ward against tornadoes. Yeah, and I I will give Sucker Punch you know credit where credits due. If the characters pull over from fantasy world to dream world to real world very smoothly Mm -hmm. like almost uncomfortably smoothly and that was something that i always kind of thought was odd with wizard of oz is unless you've seen a whole bunch of variations of it there's always parts that feel like they're missing oh yeah even even the animated one that i watched and i've read the book granted it's it's been a little while since i read it but even even having watched three different versions and having read the book, there were still portions that I had to stop and really question where someone was. Whereas with Sucker Punch, I never questioned where anyone was. Mm-hmm. Minus the one time that my husband got some of the background girls confused on who was dead. <laughs> Granted, the eye makeup doesn't help. They all they were blending in a little bit. They all have that grungy, edgy teenager. It's it's when you put on too much mascara and then rub your eyes and you forget your makeup on and then you're like, eh, fuck it, I'll just be grunge for the day. <laughs> um, but well, and I mean, going back to like the narrative, uh, the, there's a movie that is kind of the pioneer for the unreliable uh, uh, narrator, and that's the Cabinet of Doctor Caligari. Yes. And you could definitely see influence from uh, from Sucker Punch from it, just in the fact that there were definitely twists and turns that were put there on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas with Wizard of Oz, you never got that twist and turn, which is why I think a lot of people put it as the family movie. You get the little twist, but you're never you're never uh, so far into Oz that you forget that Oz isn't real. Yeah. Every time you're, like, getting comfortable with Oz, we get a new little thing that's like, oh, yeah, I know you're comfortable with talking Tin Men's and Wizards and all that. How about some Flying Monkeys? Yeah. Which, yeah, it's an interesting standpoint. Um, if, you, if you've never seen The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, probably the most recent film I can equate it to is, like, Shutter Island. Yeah, Shutter Island definitely felt like a, a spiritual following of mm-hmm. that and I, I say Sucker Punch has themes from it, mostly just because the point of the movie is for you to question what is real at all times. Yes. Whereas Wizard of Oz doesn't do that. It's it's a dive straight into fantasy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like Narnia. Yeah. But also not, because Narnia did a good job of throwing in enough little hints where, eh, Maybe. Whereas with Oz, even at the end where we were supposed to be given a couple of nuggets where, oh, maybe it wasn't in her head, but it wasn't strong enough for for an adult to be like, yes, no. Yeah. Definitely could have had some extra bits in there. Mm-hmm. Whereas with Sucker Punch, even Sucker Punch's ending, I don't think was so convoluted that you couldn't tell what was going on, like yeah. with Shutter Island. But it definitely was... Su- it definitely left you with the question of your head in your head of, di- was that this portion? It, mm-hmm. Are we actually done? Yeah. But I don't. I don't hate that. Like the the different versions of having dream worlds. I kind of like having both because sometimes you want to wake up and sometimes you just want to watch whatever's going on. I don't want to leave Skyrim kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Those those rabbit holes. Exactly. But. Yeah. I, oh, overall, I, I still think culturally, Wizard of Oz is an important film, and I, I do believe people should watch it. it yes, it's it's definitely like even though it it has aged a bit, it is a film that people need to watch if you if you're into film at least. Yeah. Well, and even if you're not into film, if you've never seen it, 
you've already heard most of the movie. Mm-hmm. It's one of the most quoted movies of all time. Yes. Might as well just watch it. That way you realize all of these little bits that you didn't even recognize were part of every day are coming from that. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of nice to be reminded of it again so that you can you can go back and appreciate it. Whereas Sucker Punch, I love it. I will probably watch it again at some point. I wouldn't put it high on my list. It's just when is that some point? It, you know, next time someone's like, oh, I haven't seen it. Cool, let's pop it in. <laughs> or a friend's like, I need a drink and watch something mindless a little bit. Yes. So, but like, and that that's an interesting thing about like the legacy of stuff. Like uh, Victor Fleming, the credited director, because Reservoir has had multiple directors. Um, he actually had to leave the production towards the end. And, I read that. And the Kansas was, uh, only the Kansas scenes were shot by someone else. And he actually, he left to go direct, or go, go back to directing Gone with the Wind. Yeah, and I kind of thought it was interesting that when it came out, it did win awards, I think mostly for music, um, but it lost to Gone with the Wind for, I think, Best Picture? Yes. And Which... It was kind of interesting because Gone with the Wind is another movie where you might not necessarily normally enjoy that genre, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a good, solid, staple movie. Yeah. Um, and, it's long as all get out. Oh, yeah. But... No, and Erica keeps trying to get us to watch it. It's like, we, we don't have time. And, well, it's the same thing with Seven Samurai, which yeah, Seven Samurai was the second longest film next to Gone with the Wind for a long time. Yeah, but at the same time, if I can make time out of my uh, week to watch Lord of the Rings extended version on a regular mm. basis, I could probably cut out a little bit of time to rewatch some of these older movies that, yeah, they're stupid long, but there's portions of it that I didn't even register were part of that movie. Example being um, the term follow the yellow brick road. I don't even remember what it was. I think it was a commercial sometime this week. Popped back up and I was like, really? (laughs) We're we're still quoting it. (laughs) We are still quoting it. I don't... Whereas with with Sucker Punch, yeah, it's a good movie as far as entertainment wise. It... But it doesn't have any lasting bit to take home with you. No. Which... I don't necessarily think means it's a bad movie, but it's not, it's not the impact yeah. of Oz. So. Well, and that's the thing is like, we, we can talk about it. We can keep going on and on and on about Wizard of Oz, but I mean, it, it it's a cultural icon. I mean, you can't, it's something you just can't deny altogether. True. Very true. So do we want to have a rating system for this podcast uh i don't know i mean you, you know i've had a rate i've been struggling with my own rating system for like the past six months because i i i mean my the number system is fine but it's everything's kind of arbitrary in a rating system this is true so how about this i give wizard of oz 124 munchkins and sucker punch one samurai sword one samurai sword yeah, I I would agree with that. I I'd say give it a watch if you're. I would give Wizard of Oz. It it is it's a must watch. Definitely. Sucker Punch. Watch if you're into that stuff. Yeah, it's a fun time. Yes. All right. Well, thanks for putting up with our first episode. We <laughs> hope to keep doing this. Um, next time we're hoping to talk about Godzilla in anticipation for the new yes. movie. I am excited. I don't watch trailers, and I've only seen like the teaser, and I am actually I'm interested in it. I live for trailers. <laughs> I want things spoiled at all times to me. I am very excited for this movie. All right. Well, this is the good, the bad, and the weird. And we'll see you next time. Peace out. <laughs>